Hi, welcome to Perry Pierre Podcast. I am your host, Perry Pierre. Our guest today is Jonathan Latona. He is a filmmaker. Uh, his most recent film is currently available on Amazon entitled Doug. We've also worked together on two projects before, Hawk and King of the Blue Ridge. So, uh, John, welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. Thank you. How did your passion for filmmaking start? Oh, man. Um, well, it's a long one. <laughs> so I'll try to shorten it down. But uh, we let's see. I started my whole obsession with uh, filmmaking pretty much began around, like, I would say high school, around, like, uh, sophomore year of high school, I wanted to do a lot of uh, acting, a lot of film acting. And I started doing a lot of theater work and I started doing a lot of, um, you know, a lot of uh, smaller roles, nothing really too crazy about whatever I can get my hands on, student play wise, things like that. And I eventually just kind of like grew out of love for acting and I started. Oh, so you studied as, a, act, as an actor, right? Yeah, yeah, when okay. I was like 16 or 17, and then I started doing a lot of research on movies because mm -hmm. I was like, well, you know, I, I was enjoying the creative process a lot more. And then once I uh, did research on my favorite directors and, favorite, you know, actors and writers and, you know, just went down this whole labyrinth of just people that I admired and I finally, uh, you know, discovered what I wanted to do and it was make my own movies. And, uh, and I didn't really know at the time how that would happen. Uh, and then after I graduated high school, when I moved to Wilmington, North Carolina, that's when things started to change a little bit. And um, when I went to school there at uh, Cape Fear Community College and uh, just started kind of learning grassroots guerrilla filmmaking, I just fell more and more in love with it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, now it's pretty much, you know, it developed from like, this whole love to this obsession and now i can't get enough of it and now <laughs> you know i'm out here you know hustling every day and it's a dream come true to be completely honest it really is okay man that's that's awesome so you went to high school um in north carolina and also college you met you met peter in college right? i went to uh i went to high school in florida and then oh, I in moved. florida oh yeah okay. and then i moved to oh it's cool no worries but yeah, when I talk about it, it's like I kind of like blend it all into one place because right. like, you know, but yeah. Um, and Peter and I met in a, uh, uh, Peter Ellenis and I met in a uh, film uh, camera acting, uh, like it was like a, uh, actually no, it was a directing class. It was like directing play class. Oh, and it was a very small class of like maybe eight people and me and Peter were among the classmates who were just like, you know, once we started talking, we couldn't stop talking. And then we eventually <laughs> just bonded over the fact that, you know, we're both Greek and we're both, you know, uh, filmmakers and we love classic films and things like that. So, um, so yeah, so it kind of developed uh, a little on accident and a weird, very strange place. <laughs> mm -hmm. which was in uh you know a part of the school that like nobody really went down like so, <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so <laughs> i got you yeah um so so what are some of your favorite classic films um and obviously some of your favorite directors um well i my favorite directors are uh pretty much like if you had to kind of narrow it down it would be like David Lynch, Martin Scorsese, um, <clears throat> you know, um, trying to think of more John Cassavetes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I would say Tarantino, but he's everybody's favorite, right? But like, <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, but like you those guys, pretty, pretty much. <laughs> well, you know, it's like it's like those dudes. Like, you know, I mean, we we you know, when you when you mention those household names, people know who you're talking about, and so like mm -hmm. those guys. Guys, I would say, you know, I, I watched, um, I remember watching Taxi Driver for the first time and my mom said, oh man, you're in for a treat because this guy made this and he was way ahead of his time. And I was like, oh right. really? I'm, I didn't know what that meant until I watched it and that became part of my obsession. And uh, and then watching uh, Eraserhead for the first time and then watching Mulholland Drive and 
telling all your friends, you know, oh yeah, my favorite movie is Mulholland Drive and they look at you like you're crazy. You know, that's, mm-hmm. you know, those are my favorite directors. So, uh, uh-huh. but, uh, but as far as like, you know, um, like a lot of movies too, like uh, some movies by, you know, I admire Ingmar Bergman and I admire, uh, you know, um, old movies from like back in the 50s 60s you know 60s oh, okay. is kind of like 60s 70s is kind of like my my niche era this is the era that i watched the most yeah. of so so everything that was done in like the golden age of hollywood as they say like in the 50s and 40s i'm not really too too you know clear on i i've seen plenty of orson welles movies i've seen plenty of that stuff but it's like more so in the uh when hollywood was going independent and we had all these like you know big time like these small time guys making big time ideas and john castavetes was making all these art house pictures like you know the, that's my inspiration so um oh, okay so i would say yeah yeah so so i've always you know i've always known you as a dp director of photography you know obviously you were the dp for King of the bridge and hawk um i i didn't know you that that you know you you could also direct, you know, and, uh, you know, we're going to talk about the film a little bit more. Um, but, um, but uh, you know, which one is like your, you know, your go-to? Like if you could pick, like, if like, let's just say a big studio comes up to you and be like, hey, you can either direct this film or be a DP on it. Which one would you pick? Um, I probably opt to uh, mainly just direct you know, if it were like, you can only choose one, I'd probably just choose to direct it. But, you know, there would be a lot of cases where I would literally fight to have the camera in my hands, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So, so like, so, you know, I would say, yeah, I would say like, you know, directing is really what, it's what everybody wants to do. It's definitely one of my first loves, but like, as far as like trying to get my ideas across, you know, I, my brain works more in like a very very visual manner and so when I can actually like you know take the camera and do what I want with it and show them what I want to do with it that's kind of where you know my whole idea of filmmaking actually comes from even though like it's a whole collaborative process and everything Mm -hmm. um, I would totally love to you know have somebody else shoot something and then you know have me direct it but right now I don't have that luxury but if they were like, oh, you can use, you know, this pool of like A-list DPs. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like if I could, you know, if I could do something with like Roger Deakins or Robert Ellswit, absolutely. You know, sure. Why not? That'd be a dream come true. Um, right. But, you know, in the meantime, though, um, it's, uh, it, it, I learned in a very kind of hands-on approach, you know, mm-hmm. and one of the ways that like when uh, when I was growing up, uh, the book Rebel Without a Crew by Robert Rodriguez was really a huge inspiration for, you know, how a film set could work, you mm-hmm. know, and it, it didn't need to be too complicated, basically, yeah. was what it told me. And I was just like, oh, okay, so this is doable. You know, anybody can kind of figure out a way to do it, you know, and I've had over a decade of experience, mm-hmm. so with that under your belt and collaborating with people like Peter and like you Mm -hmm. and like other people that we've had the liberties of collaborating with from, you know, your, uh, your class and everything. It's just, you know, it's, it's great because you get to see all sorts of talents and where you are. And so, you know, I'm always learning and I'm always picking up new things and trying stuff new, you know, trying something new. And, but, um, but, you know, I just, I don't know, I've never really, trusted at this point in my life anyway <laughs> you know yeah. it's hard to get the camera out of my hands so but <laughs> yeah but like there are there are several like dp directors that i've you know come across and i'm like well if she can do it if he can do it why can't i do it you know and so I yeah no, no i mean i, I absolutely i know Roger it's already a, it's already a kid, by the way i know I, who's I, that roger deakins He's, he's just oh, yeah, great. He's fantastic. Yeah, for yeah, the people listening, he's the DP on, on the film uh, 1917 that came out last year. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, he's but, also done hundreds of thousands of things from Coen Brothers and everybody yeah, else. Yeah, like Sicario. So, yeah. I think he did Sicario. Mm-hmm. Yep. 
and you know plenty of other projects um you know i never i never got the chance to ask anybody this question because uh you know most of the people that i've got gotten on board haven't really written except peter ellenis but i wanted to ask you what was it like working with me and you know even peter as well but with me as a producer um and peter <laughs> what is it like working with us i've never i've never heard someone actually say it so i want to i want to ask uh ask that um you know especially on king of the blue ridge for instance i know i know you know you know kind of you kind of know like some of the hoops that we went through and to be able to still be uh, uh, uh put this film together so so what sure. was it like <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, uh well this is the moment you've been waiting for right <laughs> <laughs> no no it honestly honestly it was a a dream come true you know it really was and i you know i i've worked i've collaborated with a lot of people uh with like i've only been in la for like six years i've collaborated with so many different types of personalities and you guys in general, you know, are the best type of personality to work with because it's all smooth, it's all coordinated. And, yeah. you know, we're never running behind. We're always having a fun time. You know, we're always like letting loose. I mean, you know, I'm having a good time when, you know, I'm not thinking so much about what comes next. We're just living in the moment <laughs> yeah. and trying to get things done. So like there were so many moments on King of the Blue Ridge. I was like, well, you know, I guess we're recording. <laughs> and if we don't get anything that we <laughs> whatever it's my fault but no we got everything that we needed but it was like that kind of feeling though you know where it was just like everything was just perfectly smooth and like you know yeah. we weren't really over analyzing everything and same thing too like with hawk you know like yeah. both those projects were really special because uh i was like in a in a very strange place personally so that was my like get away and escape from all of the personal things that are happening in my life at the time. So um, those two movies definitely have a, uh, a, a fond place in my heart for sure. And, uh, you know, just getting it done too, like, you know, and having it screen at the, uh, the Chinese theater, that was a huge oh, yeah. win. You know, oh, yeah, I mean, that was like, <laughs> that was like a moment where I was like, yes, that we, we've made like, despite what anybody else thinks, you know, exactly. here's the proof, you know, so. Um, yeah, man, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's awesome. I mean, dude, I have to say, man, you, you, you worked so hard, especially on like, you know, the Blue Ridge, like when we were on oh, set, you. I remember it was like so hot. You know, I don't even remember because it was like end of July and it was like some days were very, very hot, like 100 degrees. But man, you were, you, oh, yeah. you, you were just on a roll, man. Some, some, some <laughs> moments I just wanted to sit down, but you, you were like, yeah, like, let's do it. Let's do it. And for 12 hour, uh, you know, with 12 hour days, you know, sometimes it gets, it gets hard, but you, you did not complain about like the length of, of the shoot or anything like that. Um, so, oh, thanks, man. so yeah, man, I think, uh, that's one thing I appreciate about you. It's like your work ethic. It's like, it's like, you know, it's extraordinary. And I think, oh, thanks, um, that's probably the reason that you were able to write, direct, direct, and still you were the DP and the editor on the film duck. So yes. let's start about, <laughs> let's, yeah, let's start about the writing process a little bit. Um, sure. First of all, does it does it hit home a little bit, or I mean, I know you know you're not really into the acting, and you have kind of like left it behind since since you know you're right. in high school. No, but yeah, yeah. But, um, no, it's a fair but yeah, question. tell me about the the story a little bit. Where where did you get the inspiration from? Um, well, it's oh geez, when I moved here, when we moved here, my roommates and I from uh, North Carolina, we were like, you know, dead set on just getting things done any way possible, you know, that we can actually like, think of and we developed and wrote and, uh, you know, shot a, a bunch of short concept films and things like that. And uh, we were getting our feet wet. While we were doing that, I was writing this feature film. And it took me five years, pretty much, just to write the whole movie. And, wow. um, and you know, it wasn't really perfect the first ten times, I think. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like a mess. <laughs> because yeah. I didn't really know which direction it was going to go in. And all I knew was that I had my actor chosen. Um, I'd worked with Doug Burt on a bunch of uh different projects we'd done a commercial before 
and then we were working on um, his feature uh, called The Lost One. And I pretty much jumped on that, you know, while he was shooting it. And I told him, I just like, you know, I just want to shoot with you. I just want to make movies with you. You know, let's inspire each other. Let's move forward. Let's collaborate. You know, let's explore. Mm -hmm. And he totally loved that and rolled with it. And we made The Lost One. Took us about maybe, I don't know, about, I don't know, maybe a half a year to shoot it. But he had been doing a bunch of stuff with it already. So, Mm -hmm. um. So yeah, he got that completed. And then while he was like, you know, a, maybe a year or two after that, I had floated the script to him and I finally felt comfortable enough to give him like draft 13, you know, <laughs> something <laughs> really, it wasn't, it still wasn't tight. And I have to tell you within the first maybe 20 drafts, mm-hmm. you know, the ending was just a mess and Doug would die and all this other stuff. Like there was like a draft where he get he jumps off the top of a parking garage. And so I was just like, yeah, no, we can't do that. There was another draft where, you know, he was like, uh, like the whole concept of like fighting with yourself right. was very apparent, you know? Mm-hmm. And I was in a very just strange place. You know, I was in a dead end job. I didn't really like, where I was working, but I appreciated the people that I worked with and they were all actors. And I said, man, you know, there's got to be an opportunity for these guys, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I was inspired by the uh, the show Louie, which unfortunately is not on TV anymore. The only way you can get an idea of that show is to look it up on YouTube, but it was that surreal irreverence that I really loved. And I was like, oh man, I was like, this is easy and I can do this. And with my training from school and, you know, guerrilla filmmaking and my whole outlook towards like doing it all completely independently, um, you know, it just things clicked. And I said, okay, I have a person in mind. I have an actor in mind for every character. And I just wrote the script as ridiculous as it was. I just kept going and going and going. And it was maybe about the 20th draft, maybe the third year in things started looking like it did in the movie and so I was like okay this is exciting now (laughs) and and I look back at the draft too and it's funny because for I think it was in 2017 was the most writing I've ever done of Doug and I cranked out a draft per month wow (laughs) <laughs> and just retooling, reworking, what if we did this, what if we did that, adding scenes, this and that. So eventually I had something that I could own and I felt good enough to own it. And I had an, a, a, a reason for everything. I had an explanation for everything and I just wanted to go forward and do it. And so uh, we were ready to shoot and it must have been um, May... March or May, like March, April, May, something like that, Mm -hmm. springtime of 2018. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I I was, I asked Doug if he was ready to do it, and I had all my people cast, and I had blocked everything out by location, so like, I would basically have one location, and I would have numbers of which scenes, you know, coalesced with that location, and how many days it would probably be and how long each you know scene was and then um scheduled it out that way and then did the easiest scenes first and then eventually made our way down to the harder scenes which where we would have to pay for locations and things like that so the whole thing was shot way way out of sequence we did the climax as the first main group of scenes and then we did doug running around hollywood around halloween and then a couple other things we kind of like had to do pickup shots here and there. So, um, yeah. but all in all, though, it took us uh, 11 months and uh, five days to shoot the whole movie. And uh, I was still tinkering with the script even as we were going. <laughs> so, you know, there were certain things like locations that we couldn't get. And so I had to, you know, cross out a few things, blend some scenes together and, you know, and, uh, but slowly but surely it worked and uh thankfully we were able to get everything we needed and so uh you know i would say it was definitely uh it was kind of like if you know if i was going to like a university this this would totally be like my doctorate thesis 
You know what I mean? Yeah. Because it was literally that much work was put into this thing. And then editing the thing was just, I was editing as we were shooting uh, on my off time. And so, okay. uh, yeah. So um, that kind of helped to, you too, right? Like that kind of helped you, oh, big like, time. you know, to know like what you need or what you need to get better at or something like that, things like that, right? Yeah, that was clutch because then I can actually show people that, hey, I'm not crazy. This is what this looks like. <laughs> you know? Right, right. And you can actually show them the result and say, hey, look, you know, this is that scene. And there were uh, several moments, too, where uh, we had already shot certain certain parts. You know, we had shot the beginning or end of a certain sequence, but we hadn't shot the other parts yet. <laughs> And mm -hmm. so we had to kind of just blend those in any which way we could. Um, but, you know, that's try and true to the process, right? I mean, that's oh, what they yeah, always say. Absolutely. You know, it's <laughs> always out of sequence and then you put it together. I didn't really understand and that whole cut because, like, I'd have been afraid to shoot out of sequence my whole life, you know? Mm -hmm. So I would say that, uh, you know, understand, like, keeping a good, a firm, focused eyeball on the uh, the scenes and what and what the in and out points were for each scene and then having edited those parts if i needed to i can take a picture or record you know the timeline with my phone and show the actors hey this is what you did months ago do this part now <laughs> you know oh, okay. do this little <laughs> scene now and then you know we can blend it all together in the editing process and go from there so yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, first of all, great job to you, man, being able to do a feature film and to complete, I mean, being able to complete a feature film, you know, that's a, that's a, you know, whole ball game. As far as the sound mixing, did you, did you do any dubbing? Cause I, cause I feel like oh, the yeah. sound was just oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We, well, no, this is, so I got to give major, major, major props to my sound designer, Mike Wargo. He killed it. He did such an excellent job with you know he's a sound guy through and through you know and he like uh like i'm a camera nerd he's a sound nerd you know uh and mike wargo man he showed he you know really awesome dude very cool guy i've known him since uh, college and everything but he went to uh, uncw and so um i was collaborating with a lot of the same people at the time and met him through a mutual friend of ours and then when he moved out here we connected immediately and mm -hmm. uh you know he just wants to do sound do post-production and uh that's really his forte but he he gets killer audio on set all the time and the funny thing was was like when we needed um you know i tried basically like the scenes where i didn't want to waste anybody's time you know so the scenes that are small mm -hmm. that we did like in cars and stuff like that it was just like a lav mic hooked up to my phone and then the bigger scenes where it was like the cafe mm -hmm. or like um you know the audition scenes things like that uh i would use i would ask mike wargo to come down record audio uh the days that he wasn't available i would ask another friend of mine andy uh, andy kern to show up and help out too and so uh but then you know the whole post process for uh, Mike Wargo and I even like going through the whole post production process uh, was definitely new territory for us because we had only like he had mixed shorts and uh, he hadn't really mixed a full length feature with like mm -hmm. crisp audio before you know and so that whole process took him I want to say like oh man maybe five or six months Mm -hmm. you know something like that and then and and mind you like we're like we're both working jobs in between you know mm -hmm. trying to do this so it's like completely like on our own time independently and uh and a lot of the scenes that we ended up uh couldn't get very clear he did a lot of a fair amount of adr uh you know there was a lot of adr to be done in some of the uh, this was one scene like the black box scene in particular uh, actually, it's funny, Peter was doing the audio for the black box scene because I couldn't find anybody else to hold a boom mic. And so mm -hmm. Peter held the boom mic and uh, then, you know, certain 
like because the room was so large we couldn't really get him in a lot of the like we couldn't get clear enough audio so we captured what we could and then uh, a lot of the scenes where uh, you know that were in the black box where Doug is in his own mind some of that was ADR'd uh, and then we did a bunch of you know just trying to basically pull enough favors as we could the day of and you know let's face it we didn't get clear audio all the time you know mm-hmm. so we had to go back in ADR a good amount of it um, all of the like uh, there's a lot of foley in there too mm-hmm. uh, and that's all and that's all Mike Wargo you know he's a genius and uh, he made it sound full and then when we did a private screening of it in an actual like cuz we hadn't we only heard it in our speakers and he has pretty decent speakers when he's like doing sound work and everything but when we heard it on a huge you know surround sound thing Mm -hmm. (laughs) forget it it was like (laughs) whoa it was like like, you know yeah it was like the guy in the chair and his hair falls back and everything we couldn't you know so it was it was uh, you know beautiful and so now we're just you know working on collaborating on more stuff in the future and uh and two for like a film like this too you know, we both knew that having decent sound was going yeah. to be top notch. I mean, yeah. it always is, but like, you know, it's a feature film shot in 4K. Mm-hmm. You know, we're trying to make it look presentable. We're not trying to, you know, jip anybody out of an experience. And uh, even though we couldn't, you know, really like we got gypped, you know, because of COVID. <laughs> Yeah, you know, in a weird way. Yeah, uh, I feel like you know, if it wasn't for COVID right now, you would have been like going through the US attending film festivals and whatnot. Oh yeah, I would have been I would have been going to the theaters and, and you know, giving them Blu ray copies of it, telling them to play it, you know, like mm-hmm. I would have been going all over town. But that's not gonna stop me. I mean, you know, um it's on Amazon Prime and it's yeah. gonna live there forever pretty much. Um yeah. unless somebody buys it which that's, you know, be all end all. That would be a dream come true. Um, I currently own it, so I have no problems in, like, you know, licensing it out or anything, but that's a whole other conversation, I feel like. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm, yeah. still, I'm still trying to figure all that out. Right now, though, it's, you know, we had, a, uh, we had one festival run, and then, um, you know, a lot of the other festivals just kept getting pushed back and pushed back, and I was like, you know, I was like, this like fuck this this doesn't make any sense we need to get this thing out there we can't wait anymore you know Mm -hmm. because people are just sitting at home they want something to watch yeah (laughs) you know so the supply is limited because the demand is really really high all of a sudden Mm -hmm. and so now uh hopefully like this will be a calling card for not just myself but for other people who worked on it all the you know every actor who was in it too uh you know i just hope that like we get it out there and people watch it. That's really it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so, so you, you, since you wrote it and you were the DP on it and uh, uh, you also directed it, did you have like a shot list or is it like something that you were like, um, you know, doing as you go I had, to the shot list? Mm-hmm. I had, uh, well, I, I had uh, rudimentary shot lists. Mm-hmm. You okay. know, I don't really, and like, you know, and Peter can attest to this too. Um, <laughs> I I like writing down shot lists just to keep them as a checklist. But I write down a ton of shots, and I don't really get all of them. You know, uh-huh. so I won't know exactly what something looks like until I actually go out and do it. And so, like in this case, I didn't storyboard it because I knew what I wanted it to kind of feel like. You know. There are moments where I was like, yeah, this this kind of should feel right if we do a pan here or if we do a tilt up to the sky here, things like that. But, you know, some shots, like some scenes I had, I'd written down on the actual pages, um, on the actual, like, the, uh, I guess you can call them the, uh, the director's sides, um, you know, what uh, what I wanted in terms of, like, framing if if there was any special frame design if there was any special kind of like movement to keep in mind things like that and then I would put it in my back pocket and then I would like take it out and I would like obsessively look at it and tear it to shreds and you know write all over it and things like that and you know a lot of times I would write things that were only like ideas that only I could think of like 
you know, meant for me, you know, the camera should go this way or it should turn sideways or whatever, you know? Um, yeah. So I don't know. There were, you know, it was kind of like yes and no. Like some days I required, I needed it because, you know, we only had like, like the cafe scene, for instance, every cafe scene was shot in one day for uh, maybe 10 hours. And okay. uh, we rented out a cafe um, in Glendale and we shot uh, Glendale, California, not Glendale, Arizona, mm -hmm. Glendale, yeah. California, <laughs> we shot it here and uh, we shot it all in LA. So we shot it in Glendale and uh, we took over this cafe for about 10 hours. And, uh, you know, the owner was very, he was very cool, but he still had customers in the patio. Oh. And so some of those scenes where you see a bunch of people sitting inside, those are all extras. Some of those scenes where you see people outside, those are real customers. Okay. And so we, so there <laughs> I, think, I think there was a scene where, where, uh, well, I don't know if I, that, that would be giving away too much, but like he, 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 he goes to, uh, he was trying to, talk to someone and then there was some somebody outside in the window that was actually just yes. looking oh no that's not gonna give anything away no no but yes that was <laughs> that was it that that guy he yeah <laughs> like, he made that whole moment and you know that's one of my favorite moments too because i like, know <laughs> you know when when the executives laugh at his face and they slam on the table and everything mm -hmm. you know the guy looks back and it's just like you know just confirmation that people within you know that that the world itself is a living breathing thing that it's not yeah you know, and that's and that's one of my favorite types of types of filmmaking because like you see it a lot in kurosawa movies you know where everything just moves in john ford movies too you know like there's movement within the frame even though the frame is static but there's so much information happening you know and you just kind of interpret it for yourself like oh man it's kind of like a sad moment or it could be a very funny moment and to me it's just you know, there's a lot of anger in this movie and there's yeah. a lot of, you know, and that comes out in the comedy. And so, um, you know, with that in mind, like a lot of the things that just happened, I didn't really notice until I looked in the frame the yeah. next day. So it <laughs> well, was yeah. completely, some of it was completely by accident. And I was like, we need to keep that in the movie, you know? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so but that's, when... the, that's the beauty of it, you know? Yeah. So when was it during like the creative process of uh, making this film that you decide that it was going to be, you know, mostly black and white? The, the very beginning. The very beginning? Um, okay. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. I wanted that. to do, well, because I'd never seen anything like that before. You know, I had never seen the movie that was mostly in black and white with hints of color. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'd yeah. seen it in like Schindler's List and everything, but I'd never seen it where it's just like, you know, when he, when he gets to this moment where, you know, he starts to, the, uh, the glass ceiling sort of breaks and mm -hmm. there's this intoxication with fame that happens, you know, mm -hmm. that whole bit I've always wanted to keep in color because that's the essential part of it, you know, but it really hits home when you really think, oh man, like everything is just very, you know, black and white with this guy, <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. like there's nothing really like the world itself is just this very cynical outlook. Yeah. And, uh, and also too, you know, it's funny because like when I was doing it and when we were making it, you know, there were a lot of things that started having that same kind of color balance, you know, mm -hmm. but I mean, yeah, it's just the black and white really just made, cause you know, at a certain point I just wanted to, uh, to just make a movie where it was kind of like resemble the closest thing to resembling 16 millimeter film without having to be 16 millimeter film. Right. You know? <laughs> and so when people see it, they're going to see it in black and white. When I see it, it's something completely different to me. It's, you know, like an old school, like, you know, mm -hmm. 16 millimeter black and white, like kind of like if, uh, you know, faces by John Cassavetes or like, you know, those types of, that type of look, you know, and, yeah. uh, I like, and I like it really started to, mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I like the fact at the beginning, cause I, cause I'd seen the trailer before. And then when I started watching the film and the title cards were in, they were very colorful, you know, like yes. you know, multiple yes. colors. I'm like, Hmm. 
I like where he's going with this because I because I because I knew the the film was in black and white, and I was like, oh, interesting. And then at the end, usually like for most films, um, at the end it's like it's like you know black and then white letters, uh, white yeah. characters. But for you, it was different. That it was like you know it was a. Uh, was it red? I think, and then you. Know, it was colors. red. Yeah, we yeah. we opened we opened in red, and we leave. And red was a very. It became the the theme to the movie because uh, the, mm-hmm. uh, the 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 dreamscape that he goes into, you know, it's all red. You know, there's yeah. a lot of red there. The whole thing is just blood, l- lust, and colorful, and mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of like just this, you know, cautionary thing, um, and that whole bit too. That whole dream sequence thing where he's in the party and everything that was that was in the script from day since day one actually Mm -hmm. that had been but you know it was always one of those random moments that happens but then eventually keeping that in there and writing more and more and more over the years i was able to blend it in a little bit better and so uh but yeah that was always one of those things that i wanted and it was like a very like was intended to be like the gaspar in the way moment you know, mm-hmm. very uh, just brutal and in your face, kind of like how irreversible was with that one scene with a fire hydrant. You know, it was just kind of like that, but yeah. not as gory. You know, <laughs> so that's kind of what we, what I've always wanted to try doing. And I was like, well, if this is going to be a big idea, and I'm going to sink so much time into it, why not? You know, and that's really yeah. what it came down to was what did I want to do at the time, and how could we do it with the, you know lack of money but with the tons of experience that we have yeah yeah no absolutely i like i like this scene at, at the beach as well uh was it was it shot in malibu uh it was in uh, sycamore cove uh so malibu area but like all the way the northernmost point of like malibu oh, okay, okay, you know? okay, okay yeah all the way up there yeah and uh and that scene too, that was actually like all the scenes on the beach were done the very last day, just coincidentally. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we, you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't plan for that to happen. That was just like the last day. And I was like, oh, how fitting, you know, we end on the beach, you know, we started in a car on the way to the beach and we ended on the beach. And so that was really cool. Yeah. But, uh, so what is like, what is the uh, the message? I was gonna say, what is the message that you want people to take away, um, you know, after watching the movie? Um, well, or is that this, this you is wanna... one of those? Mm-hmm, go ahead. Well, no, because the you know, even when I was writing it, you know, like talking about the writing process itself, like I had always wanted to make a movie about somebody who went off the deep end you know and this was pretty much that but like there were additional themes to it that I didn't really expect and when we were making it and when we were doing it um you know over time of just kind of assembling putting it together and trying to figure out just like you know what it really meant I mean, I really had no idea what it meant up until maybe editing it, Mm -hmm. maybe, like, truthfully, like, I had no idea. Like, I knew it was about something, and I knew the themes were there, and I knew the story was there, but there was just, it was like something in front of me that I couldn't see, and that was the frustrating part because, you know, over time, I just wanted just to tell something cohesive that people would enjoy. I had no idea that people would say, yeah, I know tons of people like that. I know people who, you know, spend their whole life working for something and then never get it. And I was like, oh my God, that's the movie. (laughs) You know, it just clicked. It just clicked, you know, because like there's, there's a lot of ways like, you know, I mean, you've been to film school. So, you know, they talk about man versus man, you know, man versus environment. You know, this is basically like man versus man, man versus environment, man versus everything, like, you know, self, society, uh, <laughs> society at large. Yeah, I mean, there's so many things happening, but really what it comes down to and what I'm just starting to learn about is that, you know, dreams have limits that, you know, even though you get everything, are you happy? You know, what is success? How is success measured out? How is, 
you know yes yes like what do you what do you think about when you think about hollywood what do you think about when you think about fame and making it you know and i don't think any and i think the reason why it didn't really sit with me for the first maybe couple of times and actually just thinking about it like it didn't really hit me until late later was because um you know i was thinking too much like the character mm-hmm. you know in my own way i had this this selfishness about going into this and and you you know using it as a career you know this is my path this is my career choice the what ifs never fostered in my head and i guess this is my little freudian slip just coming out and saying yeah like this is a scary fucking world (laughs) this is a scary industry this is a scary place you know and so all of this as a whole uh that's kind of like you know it's it's just it's a it's you know life is very all all my ideas are like life is fragile but you know what i mean it's kind of like yeah especially within the enclave of hollywood which people don't really explore enough you know um it's it's a very interesting place Um, it's a very uh, it's a very interesting place i think i think what's what's interesting with the film as well it's like you not only you were able to convey this whole idea of following your dreams, you know, following your passion, but also you were also um, able to convey this uh, living in Hollywood when you're not necessarily rich. You know what I mean? Because a lot of the time, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, a lot of the times people think of LA, it's like, oh my God, I want to move to LA. You know, there's like, you know, it's beautiful. There's, there is this, there is that. But they're not mm-hmm. thinking about the nose. You know what I mean? They're not thinking about like people not being loyal. You know, they're not right. thinking about like the fact that a lot of people are in LA are not real. If I can, if I can use that term, you know, they're not thinking about like all the struggles that a lot of the actors and filmmakers that are in LA are going through. You know, because, exactly. because exactly. their stories are not actually being told right at the moment. So the stories right. that you're finding out are the stories of, of people that, that have already made it. So Right, so, exactly. Yeah, so I think that was, like, very interesting. And the other thing is, like, um, you know, what the character is going through in the film is kind of, like, parallel to what you went through in making the film as well, which is, like, something that I think, that I think is very interesting. Because it's like, hey, you know, he's going through this and this and this, but he keeps going. And for you, too, mm-hmm. you kept going to make this film. You know, like yes. it, took yeah. you, it took you like close to five years to write the script, but you, you know, you, <laughs> you stayed at it. You know, you, oh, thanks. Thanks. you know, you, yeah. you make sure that the script is, you know, is finished. And then for the shooting, it took you, you know, you said you said six months, right? No, it took 11 no eleven months. months. Eleven months, and then three. Yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Eleven months, but you, you know, you, you, you kept going. You kept going. Yeah, and thanks, right man. now, you have a product, and I think, and I think it's very. You know, this can be an inspiration to a lot of upcoming filmmakers that, listen, if you, if you have a film, you know, and you want to make it, like, you know, start, at least start writing the first word. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Day, like, you know, start, you know, put, put something there, put something there. It may take you a long time, but eventually, you, you know, you can probably in six, seven years have a feature film. And that's amazing. <laughs> and the film, and the film is on Amazon. But honestly, yes. it's gonna be hard, you know, because a lot of people they they put the first word, they do things, they're still not able to finish to complete the film, especially a feature film. I mean, the film is oh, like yeah. two hours, so it, yeah, yeah, you know, and to edit it too, it, it you know, it's it's understandable. But it takes it takes a minute to do something like this, and. Man, congratulations! I'm so proud of Thank you. you. You know, Thank you, um, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. So, um, to everyone listening, the film is available on Amazon. Just type Doug or type Jonathan Latona, or some of the names. I think I think the lead is also Doug, so you'd be able to come across it. Doug Birch. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, even if even if to uh, you go on my Instagram page at Johnny Boy mm-hmm. Films, there's a link directly to it on my bio. Um, it's also my website, jonathanlatona.com. So there's multiple ways you can access it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, it's, yeah. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> no, absolutely. I'm, I'm also going to put a link um, on, on, uh, on the description so people can just awesome. click on it awesome. to be able to get it. Um, so 
what what's the legacy that you want to leave when this is all and done like when you know a group of kids talking about john in like 50 60 years what do you <laughs> want to be remembered for <laughs> wait you, you're asking like when i'm dead <laughs> no 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 i mean obviously i don't want you to be dead in 60 years that's very no, I'm kidding. No, no, I'm kidding. I'm no no I'm i got you no no but uh no no i you know i would say honestly uh I, I would I would love if uh, if I could leave any sort of legacy on an independent level or on a soul making level that would be mm-hmm. fantastic you know if people like end up watching my movies and becoming inspired by them that's the goal right but we'll see man I mean honestly I I I have no idea I just want to continue making movies for the rest of my life and I hope that people find you know I hope you can see them. Mm-hmm. And I hope people find uh, what they're looking for with them. And I hope that it inspires them to also kind of explore their own path and do the same thing because, you know, now is the time to explore and to be inspired by other people. And, uh, you know, it's literally like one of the easiest things and, and, you know, everyone else just either they don't have the insight or the, or the know all to do it. But, you know, it is definitely possible to anything you want to get done. So if there's anything, yeah, probably that, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> probably like, you know, you could do anything as long as you put your mind to it, you know, kind of. But uh, but on a filmmaking level, um, you know, I just hope to kind of inspire people that like I was inspired when I was watching Taxi Driver and when I was watching, you know, all the Scorsese movies when I was growing up, all the David Lynch movies when I was growing up, those filmmakers in particular you know, when you get the chills about just talking about Goodfellas or anything like that, you're just like, man, you know, I watched The Departed again, like for the millionth time and I still see things that are new about it, you know, so it's just like, and then you get to talk about it and share that that is what I want to happen. So, but yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. <laughs> thank you so much, man, hey. for for being a guest on the show. Um, hey, thank you, know. you, Terry. I really appreciate it. Thank so you, everyone. man. I, it was, it was a dream come true, man. Honestly, <laughs> thank you so much. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. So everyone, don't forget to check out his film on Amazon. D-O-U-G. All right. So take care, <laughs> man. And stay healthy. <laughs> hey, thanks, Perry. You too, man.